That is our desire to be with you, Jesus. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says that nothing can separate us from his love. There's one thing that remains forever and always, and that is our king's love. Tell the person next to you, his love remains. Come on, tell, tell your neighbor, his love remains. You ready?
for his love today. Because on and on and on and on it goes. For it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid. Cause one thing, can you declare with me? Remains. Right there with your hands lifted, say it. One thing, one thing remains. Remains. We thank you for this one thing, one thing. Yeah. Remains. Sing it one more time, one thing. One thing. Remains. We sing your love. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Good morning, church. I know we've all been here, lost in the dark with no one to hear us out. Even our own friends turn our backs on us. But if there is one person who will never turn their back on us and is always there to listen, that would be our Heavenly Father. And he deserves all of the honor, glory, and praise. Amen. This next song is called Heart of Worship. And as we sing these words, I want us all to ponder them in our hearts. Let them marinate in your spirit and just think about what he has done for you and how he has brought you through the storms of life. Psalms 48, 9 says, Oh God, we meditate on your unfailing love as we worship in your temple. So let's join together and spend some one-on-one time with our Lord. Amen. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. just to breathe something that's worth that will bless your
the Rock, you know, uh, Dr. Gage had asked that this song be sung, and, and I got to be honest, it, it ministered to me, and I hope this morning it ministers to you, because some of us walk throughout our lives, and I don't know about you, but I need a whole lot of mercy for things that I've done and things that I've thought, and God has given us Jesus Christ, and he is always flowing mercy our way. If we just give him an opportunity, he'll minister to our souls and he'll change our lives. I know I have let you down so many times before. Yet you come to me in mercy. Undeserving, lost, now found. Your love begins to pour when you surround me with your mercy. Just when I feel my way is lost, and need some light to see just when I would have given up you go and mercy me mercy me when I'm falling mercy me hear me calling mercy me like raindrops falling pour your grace out on me Mercy me when I'm hurting, mercy me so undeserving, mercy me Lord when I'm dirty, wash me clean, oh my Father mercy me. My Father, mercy me, mercy me, have mercy on me. You are God and 
I am not. I am nothing without you and your incredible mercy. I need you more desperately than I need the air I breathe. Father, fill the air with mercy. Just when I feel I can't go on, about to sink beneath the sea. Just when I feel the end has come, you go and mercy me. Mercy me when I'm falling. Mercy me, hear me calling. Mercy me like raindrops falling. Pour your grace out on me. Mercy me when I'm hurting, mercy me so undeserving. Mercy me, Lord, when I'm dirty, wash me clean. Oh, my Father, mercy me. Mercy me when I'm falling, mercy me. Raindrops falling, pour your grace out on me. Mercy me when I'm hurting. Mercy me so undeserving. Mercy me, Lord, when I'm dirty. Wash me clean. Oh, my Father, mercy me. Father, mercy me. Father, it's us, your children. We've come into this place needing so much mercy. We need you now, God, like we've never needed you before in our lives, in our homes, on our jobs, where we go and where we play, we need your mercy. We failed you so many times, but we've come into this place, oh God. Use us now, fill us now, extend your hand to us now. We thank you. It's in your son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Church, can you? Just thank God for his mercy all across this room from left to right, from the front to back. Come on, lift it up, lift it up. Thank him today. God, thank you. Thank you because you saw us and you found us. Church, can you get up out of your, out of your seat and just greet somebody next to you? Hug them, they love the Lord. Greet them to your home, Christ the Rock. some video announcements. God bless you. Hi, this is Pastor Darrell. Welcome to Christ to Rock Community Church. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us here this week. Let's see what's happening this week. Let's take a selfie. Okay. Ew. Look at my nose. Ooh. I have so many pimples. Yeah, girl, you know what? I can give you a facial. Is it supposed to burn? Is oh, my skin burn? No, I promise. Um, no, it's it's just a little bit. <laughs> Girl, what happened to your face? You look like.
like Ronald McDonald. Let's Ooh, take a picture. No, don't. <laughs> Twitch! Don't let this be your summer. Sign up for our Girls Locking today where you can learn how to make a real natural facial from our skincare consultant, Miss Carol. You can also learn how to save a life by doing CPR taught by one of our camp nurses. Sign up today. Text to give is always available. Just text 77977 and type in the keyword give CRCC and follow the instructions. Names have significance. Names used to matter. As a matter of fact, all biblical names are given with an explanation of why they've been named this. God has dozens of names that he has revealed to us. Welcome to the stage, our good friend, Dr. Warren Gage. Well, good morning, Christ the Rock. Good to see everybody again. And uh, it's my joy to be with you in the month of July. Pastor Darrell has asked me to, to teach you. And so I decided I would like to talk about the greatest day in the history of the world, the day of the resurrection. East, the first Easter Sunday. So last week we looked at what would, the, what, the, what would the resurrection have been like for our precious Lord? What would it be like to come back from the dead and to see how God had blessed him with new life, having made atonement for the sin of the world? And today I would like to look at two of the women from Galilee who came to the tomb. Mary Magdalene, of course, is well known. Salome is named by Mark, but we don't know much about her. But I think I know why he named her. So I want to look at her story too. Salome and Mary Magdalene. Next week, we'll look at Peter and John. What was the resurrection like for these two chief apostles who had disappointed themselves and the Savior uh, so spectacularly in the hour of his trial? And then finally, at the end of the month, would like to look at the two disciples from Emmaus. Jesus spent the whole afternoon of the day of his great triumph encouraging these two broken-hearted disciples. So I want to look at the day of resurrection. And today, by God's grace, I'd like to look at two stories, two of the women from Galilee who followed Jesus and encouraged and supported his ministry, Mary Magdalene, and Salome, how does Mark use the story of Salome? So before we look at the scripture, let's ask the Lord if he would illumine our hearts through his spirit. Father, we thank you for your word, the gift that you gave us, the written word that became the living word in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for our Savior. We ask you, Lord, also that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, might be among us to open our hearts that we might see him. Otherwise, our study is in vain. We ask that you would open our hearts to see our precious Lord, and in seeing him to become more like him, to fall in deeper love with Jesus and his holy word. We ask these blessings for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, this is going to be an intensive scriptural study. I want to look at a number of passages and show how they all come together at the resurrection. And I want to, so we'll read the scriptures, I want to read them carefully, and I want to make some comments as we go through them. The, the chief text I want to look at is, of course, the account of the resurrection, and that begins in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. And the evangelist tells us, now when the Sabbath was passed, and we read right past this and we shouldn't, what does that Sabbath mean? 
You see, Sabbath is a Saturday, and Friday, Jesus was tortured to death on the cross. And when the Sabbath is passed, you remember that Joseph of Arimathea and, and had taken down the body of Jesus and anointed it as best he could, but the hour was late, and so it was a hasty burial as he gave Jesus his own tomb. And the women of Galilee were watching from a distance. They saw the Savior of the world. They saw the light of the world extinguished. They saw the one Jesus tortured to death. The one they had thought had been the Messiah, dead. They had watched all of that from a distance. And they saw the burial, and that it was hastily done and incompletely done. And so they resolve to finish that work. That's all they think they can do for Jesus, to show respect. But the commandment said that they should not work, and so in obedience, these godly women obeyed the law. In their perplexity, they didn't understand, but they were obedient to the word of God. But what a Sabbath that would be. How would you have handled that Sabbath? What would it mean to you if Jesus were in a grave still? if the light of the world had been extinguished by Rome, if there was no voice that taught us to love our enemies, even as God has loved us, no voice to offer forgiveness, free forgiveness for our sins, to speak about peace with God. What if Jesus were still in the tomb? What would this world be like? And what would our lives be like? But that's the world that they thought they were having to get used to, a world without Jesus. So when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices. Now Mark will teach us about two Salomes. This is the godly, the good Salome, but there will be another evil and ungodly Salome. And I think that he's, he mentions her name here. He wants us to bring these ideas together so we will understand this good Salome as we understand the wicked one. Anyway, Mary Magdalene and Salome brought spices that they might anoint Jesus, his body. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb where, when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? What a question is that? Who will roll away the stone these women, that stone was very heavy. It would take many men to move it. But this stone, particularly, who will move this stone? Have you thought about that personally? One of these days, all of us. It's appointed unto man once to die. All of us will face a grave. Can anyone unseal that grave that we might come forth? Who can do that? Who has the power to do that? And as we will see, the only one who can move that stone away is God himself, which is exactly what has happened. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very, very large, and you can imagine. God himself had sent his angel who had rolled away that stone. Now, Mark mentioned Salome, as I said, the good Salome, but in earlier, much earlier in his gospel, in chapter 6, he gives us the account of the evil, the wicked Salome. And I want to show you her story, too. Now, King Herod heard of him, Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. King Herod had heard of Jesus, for his name had become well known. And the king, in his madness, said, this is John the Baptist, he's risen from the dead. And therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said it is Elijah, others it's one of the prophets, or the prophet. But when Herod heard, he said, no, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. Now, the evangelist Mark will give us a flashback to tell us what that meant and what did that look like? Why had he severed the head off of God's holy prophet? And this is that story. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold, that is, he had arrested John, and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. 
You see, he had taken the wife of his brother as his own wife. That's incest. That's against the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, which includes all of our sexual sin. So he was living in open and notorious sin. Everybody knew this scandal. In fact, Herodias had had a daughter by his brother, Herodias. Herodias had had a daughter by, her, by his brother, and her name, we know from history, it's, there's no dispute, was Salome. So, Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison. Why did he bind him in prison? Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. The courage of God's prophet to say to the king himself, who has the power of life of death, it is not lawful for you to live in open and notorious sin. That's what the prophet had done. Therefore Herodias, Herod's wife, held it against him and wanted to kill him. She wants to silence that charge. But she could not, for Herod feared John He knew that John was a just and a holy man, and so he protected him. He guarded him in prison so that he could not subvert the kingdom publicly. But on occasion, he would bring him out and hear him, and it says he heard him gladly. It's not enough to listen to the gospel. You must obey the gospel. Herod listened, listened gladly, and continued in his life of disobedience. But then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, his accession day, gave a feast for all his nobles and high officers and the chief men, all of them from Galilee, all of the the glitterati, all of the nobles of Galilee were present at Machaerus, this palace that he had on the other side, on the eastern side of the Dead Sea, where John was held in prison. And so during that banquet, Herodias' daughter, this evil Salome, and we know her name, she came and danced a dance. Now, Mark does not name this woman because she's so wicked, he suppresses her name. But she is Salome, the daughter of Herodias. The dance that she danced, we know about this. It was provocative, it was sexual, it was wicked. In front of all of the nobles of Galilee, they are flaunting their sin. And it pleased Herod and those who sat with them. So the nobles are all enchanted by this wicked dance of this evil girl. It pleased Herod and those who were with him. And the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. He's probably drunk. But in front of all of his nobles, he says, ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. Whatever you ask up to half my kingdom. My goodness, what an offer is that? Well, what is going to have the value of half of the kingdom? And we will see. So Salome went out and asked her mother, what shall I ask? I've been promised up to half the kingdom. And her mother said, ask for the head of John the Baptist. That's how much she hated John's voice. So immediately, Salome came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once, immediately, the head of John the Baptist on a platter. She wants it immediately. Don't think about due process or a trial or anything. I want that head now. Don't hesitate. Now, I want that head. And she says, and don't just bring me the head. Bring it up on a platter. By tradition, it's a silver platter. Offer me the head on a silver platter. After all, this is a banquet, isn't it? So she's, it's grotesque. She's offering this, this head like it's a dish upon which they might feed. The disgrace and the way that the hatred of this young girl and her mother toward God's holy prophet. So the king is amazing. He's exceedingly sorry. He realizes he's on the horns of a dilemma. He knows that John is a just and holy man, but here he has made this oath in front of all of his nobles. Is he going to be seen to be a man who keeps his word? And if he keeps his word, he must kill a holy man. And so the choice is made. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And so he went and beheaded him in prison. 
and brought the head on a platter. Imagine that scene, how ghoulish, how grotesque that is. The head of God's holy prophet offered up on a silver platter to the king. And he gave it to the girl here. You could have had half the kingdom, but this, is, this was a, the worth of half the kingdom to you and your mom. And the girl gave it to her mother. And her mother had accomplished her evil purposes against God's prophet. And that voice that said it is not lawful for you to live in open notorious sin had been silenced. Now, the response to that story is given in chapter 12. And I want to say this in passing. I don't have time to, deliver, to, to evaluate it or to defend it. But the response is in chapter 12. The sin, the crime against Herod is in chapter 6. The middle of Mark's gospel is the transfiguration, and everything is arranged around the transfiguration. Three chapters before is the death of John. Three chapters after, that theme comes up again. The Gospels are not written randomly one story after the other. They are mathematically precise in where they occur in the Gospels. It is an amazing study once you undertake that. So chapter 12, the background to this, although nothing is said, the background to this story in the life of Jesus is that murder of God's prophet that we read about in chapter 6. In chapter 12, beginning in verse 13, then they sent, some, uh, sent him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. Jesus is now about to face his own death. And he is in the temple publicly teaching. And two factions come up to him. The, the Pharisees and the Herodians. Two political factions. The Pharisees are likely zealots. These, this would be part of the zealot group. The zealots hated Rome as the conquering oppressive power. And they said, we don't owe Rome any allegiance, and we certainly should not pay taxes. We should revolt against them. The Herodians were supported by the Romans. It was the Caesar who kept Herod in power. The Caesars all knew how wicked the Herodians were, but they found them useful to rule this unruly province, and so they supported them. And the Herodians were very loyal to Rome and insisted that everybody must pay taxes. So here, two factions who hated each other come together because their common enemy is Jesus. One of them is saying we should not pay taxes to Caesar. The other is saying we should pay taxes to Caesar. And they want to catch Jesus in his words because, you see, any way Jesus answers this question when they ask him, should we pay or should we not pay, if he says, should we pay, then the zealots will hate him. And the zealots, the Sicarii, carried knives and they assassinated people. He will die if he says we uh, should pay taxes. If he says that we should not pay taxes, the Herodians will charge him to the Romans for treason. And he will die. Either way, they're trying to accomplish the death of Jesus. So they come to him publicly and they say, Teacher, we know that you are true. We care about, and you care about nobody, for you do not regard the person of men. But we know you teach the way of God in truth. In other words, they're setting him up. He has to answer this question. And they've got it all planned. They think that we've caught him here. There's no answer he can give that will not bring about his death. So, so they say, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? You see the dilemma? Just like Herod had been caught on the horns of a dilemma, now Jesus is on the horns of a, deliver. a dilemma. However he answers, he is the one who will be killed. Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy. What does that mean? What is their hypocrisy? Their hypocrisy is in the way that they phrase their question. We want to know, is it lawful? To pay, to pay taxes to Caesar. We're very zealous. We care about God's law. So should we pay or should we not pay? We're not sure about the answer to that, but we're zealous about the law. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? So they're concerned about this 
minor matter of the law. But what were they overlooking? John the Baptist had said what? It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Ah, there, that's an issue. The king living in open and notorious incest, is that lawful? They're not asking that question, are they? Is it lawful to kill God's holy prophet? They're not asking that question. They're asking this little question, and we all do that, don't we? We're all concerned about how do we keep God's law? Do we keep the Sabbath on this particular day and neglect the other six days that God intended? We take some minor issue and make that major. We don't, we're like the Pharisees. Jesus said, you forget mercy and justice and you tithe the mint and cumin. You'll tithe even down to your spices. But the larger issues of the law, you will neglect and forget. So is it lawful? What about us? Don't you see? We're all Herodians, aren't we? All of us are Herodians. What does the law say? Jesus expounds the law. Here, Herod was committing open and notorious incest, which is a violation of the commandment against adultery. And then he commits murder. What did Jesus say about these two commandments? If anyone looks at another person with lust in their heart, they've already committed adultery in their heart. That means what? All of us are guilty of adultery according to God's holy law. Don't congratulate yourself if you've never committed adultery technically because the law condemns all of us. The heart, the integrity of the heart is where God, David said, desired that we have justice. And what about murder? I doubt that many of us have murder, have hands of blood, but Jesus said if anyone harbors hatred toward his neighbor, toward his brother in his heart, he is guilty of murder. And that is all of us. All of us stand condemned just as much as the Herodians. So don't get caught in the hypocrisy of thinking, these are sins of which I'm not guilty. I'm better than Herod. No, we're not. The law condemns all of us. So what hope do we have? Anyone here ever lusted after someone else? There was a woman once that was caught in adultery. And what did Jesus say to her? Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, no man, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn you. If you ask him for mercy, all of your sin can be forgiven. But you must ask him for mercy. Neither do I condemn you. What precious words are those? Have, those, have these words been spoken to your heart? What about murder? You know, Jesus was crucified with two thieves who were also murderers. We know that from Barabbas. The thieves were murderers, criminals. And what did Jesus say to that one thief that applied for mercy? Today you will be with me in paradise. That same promise can be given to any of us who ask him in grace to remember us. So this is the background now to this attempt of these evil Herodians and Pharisees to catch Jesus and his words. Now they should know, shouldn't you know? They come to catch him in his word. He is the word of God. So what's going to happen is they are going to be caught in their words in an amazing way. Watch this. So Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. And he said to them, what, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Now there is one way of looking at this. Jesus has slipped off the horns of this dilemma, hasn't he? He said, if the coin belongs to Caesar, give it to Caesar. But if it does not belong to him, don't give it to him. One way of looking at it is to say, well, we are made in the image of God, are we not? We're not made in the image of Caesar, therefore all of us should render all of ourselves to God himself. But I don't think that's exactly what Jesus means, although that's not far from his meaning. 
I want to tell you what this means and what he does with it. He, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I might see it. When I was a boy, for some reason, I found, I, I, I was interested in coin collecting and I collected ancient coins. And this is that coin. It's one like those coins. It's a coin with the head of Tiberius Caesar, the Caesar at this time. This is the denarius coin that, he, that Jesus asked for. And so this was fixed early in my mind. This is the image that I had. You can see it here. It is a silver coin with the head of Caesar on it. And what I realized as I was reading through this passage is what Jesus is doing. He says to them, why do you test me? He could have simply referred to the coin. He said, whose head is on the denarius? And all of them would have said Caesar, but he doesn't do that. He says, bring me a denarius. You see that? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So the Herodians are scrambling around. They find this coin, this silver coin with the head of Caesar on it, and the Herodians bring it to Jesus. You see what he's done? The Herodians are bringing a silver coin. The same Herodians who had brought the silver platter with the head of John the Baptist on it, before they can even think about it publicly, are offering Jesus a silver coin with the head of Caesar on it. He is condemning them before the whole crowd of the death of John the the Baptist. He's condemning them for their murder of God's holy prophet. That's how he answers them. God has not forgotten, and he will take vengeance on those who did this and justified what their king did. Bring me the denarius before they can even think about it, just like Herod was demanded of him. Give us the head without even thinking about it. Now he has condemned them publicly, and all in Israel see what he's done, and they marvel. They marveled at him. My goodness. He's bold enough to charge them with the same, with the murder of God's holy prophet. And Jesus answered them and said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Now, how does that come together? How is that the background? What this dance, this dance of death, of this evil Salome, what is the reply? Mark makes note of this fact. We come back to our text. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome the godly Salome, the good Salome. She comes to the tomb sorrowing, thinking that the Savior is dead. She comes with spices, the only gift she can offer. She comes in great sorrow, and when they came to the tomb, we're told the angels met them and said, he is not here, he is risen, as they said, as he said. What is Mark implying in that, don't you see? And just see what Mark is implying. Here is this evil Salome who danced the dance of death. And now this godly Salome, when she hears that the Savior is not dead but living, will dance in her joy for life. It's an entire reversal. The resurrection brings joy to the heart of God's people because it's his victory over sin. Don't you see how this is all redeemed? They had women had wondered, who will roll away the stone for us? For it was very large. And don't you see what God has done in remembering John, even in the resurrection of Jesus? The wicked king Herod had cut off, he'd severed the head of John. But now what has God done? You see, God has rolled away the stone. He has decapitated the tomb. He has decapitated death itself. That's what he's done. His response to the murder of his prophet is to raise up his son from death who has the door of life. That's the answer to all our problems. That's the sorrow that we have. We can become like the godly Salome who danced for life and for joy when we realize that God has rolled away the stone of the door of the tomb. All of us, one day, it's appointed for all of us to die. 
One day we will be sealed into some kind of grave. Well, who has opened that door? Who has set before you that open door? You see it as Jesus, all of you who have applied for mercy, because our precious Lord has the keys of death and Hades. So that's the story of Salome. It's a warning to us, as well as an encouragement, to seek the mercy of God, now I want, to look, I want to turn our attention now to look at Mary Magdalene. What was her story? What is the encounter that she had on the morning of the resurrection? And all we know about her background is given in this short passage in Luke chapter 8. Now it came to pass afterward, when Jesus is in his ministry, early in his ministry, he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve, his disciples, were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. It's the women who supported the ministry of the Lord. The grace of the women. It's amazing. These women who had been ministered to him, uh, ministered to him, they having been ministered by, by him. He had healed them of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, I want to mention this by way of an aside, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. Why does Luke mention her? You see, she's married to Herod's steward, who was certainly at that banquet where John was beheaded, one of the nobles of Herod. You see, Herod, the, king, the Herodian kings were Edomites. They were descended from Esau. That's why the Jews hated them, who were descended from Jacob. Didn't the scripture say, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated? Wasn't their justification biblical? No. Because as we're taught, not all Israel is Israel. And likewise, then, by that same principle, not all Edom is Edom. But God has a remnant in every nation. He has chosen a remnant to find his mercy which means that anyone can come and find his grace. The door is open. Whatever our ancestry, whatever that was, whatever our ancestral sins, none of us need to despair of the mercy of God. Here is a Herodian, an Edomite, descendant of Esau, who had faith in Jesus, was healed by him, and then supported his ministry. Joanna is a sign to us that anyone can find mercy at the cross. But Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons, seven demons, what Jesus said to those he healed of demons and drove out the demons, he said, walk in righteousness, lest seven worse ones come, and you'd be worse off than at the first. Seven demons is the worst state of demonic oppression, and here, Mary Magdalene had had seven defiling, unclean demons. What a spiritual state does that mean? The tradition of the church is that she had been a whore. Now, I don't like that word, but that is a biblical word. That word shows desperation and wickedness. She had been immoral. She had been defiled by all kinds of uncleanness. Whatever kind of defilement there could be, Mary Magdalene was involved in it. And I know that's true. Why? Because when it comes to the day of Jesus' death, she, of all people, is most grieved. She is brokenhearted. She is pouring forth her tears. And what does that mean? She clearly loved Jesus more. Why? You love much if you've been forgiven much. And she knew that from which she had been forgiven. But now the one who gave her that word of assurance that she could be forgiven by God himself is lying in a tomb. And she doesn't, she's perplexed, she has no idea. How do, you, how do you live in a world without Jesus? And she just will not leave that tomb. Others will come. And she goes and tells the disciples, but she's desperate, trying to find Jesus. She stays by that tomb. Now she went and told the disciples, uh, and Peter, she says, that they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. But when she's already seen a vision of angels who've told her that Jesus has been raised, so she comes with this, these, these reports that are totally contradictory. 
We saw a vision of angels who said that Jesus was raised from the dead, but they've taken away the Lord, and we don't know where they have laid him. One speaks of life, the other speaks of death. They look at this woman, and they think she's deranged. Maybe her demons have returned. If Jesus is in the grave, what about all of those that he healed? Will the leprosy now come back to the leper? Will all the diseases that he had healed us from go into reverse? And they look at Mary, and they think her reports are so inconsistent Perhaps that demonic derangement is, and they don't believe her. They just dismiss her as this wild woman. But Peter and John heard something in what she said. They act differently than all the rest. Peter and John run to the tomb. We'll see why next week. Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb, and they both ran together. The other disciple, that is John, outran Peter and came to the tomb first, but he hesitates. He stooped in and looked in, and he saw the linen clothes lying there. But he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and barged into the tomb, which no Jew would do, because the tomb is the place of great, greatest uncleanness. But Peter goes in, and when he comes into the tomb, he sees the linen cloth lying there and folded that unique way. And then John comes in, and he sees the same thing, and they see and believe they believe and they know that Jesus has been raised from the dead. They don't yet understand these things because we're told they did not yet understand the scriptures. They do not understand, but they believe. They do not understand he must rise from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. These two great apostles who will be the foundation of the church that God is founding. They separate and go on into their own homes, but Mary stays behind. Now, I want to show you something that the scripture is telling us. It's amazing. The greatest vision in all the Bible is about to be given, but this great vision is not given to Peter and John. The greatest vision in all of the Bible is about to be given to Mary Magdalene, the one who loved him with such sincerity. The greatest vision. Pastor Darrell has taught you faithfully about the tabernacle. And he taught you that the chief furniture in the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant. A box about the length of the trunk of a man and on either side, at the head and the foot, were two angels. And they were looking at what was between them, the mercy seat, where the high priest would sprinkle blood that would put away the sin of the people most sacred furniture in the holy ark. It represented the throne of God. And so what happens is, look what, look what happens when you read this further. So Mary stood out the tomb weeping. Peter and John are leaving and going away. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. She stooped in the posture of humility. And through her tears, what did she see? She sees two angels sitting at the head and at the foot of where the body of Jesus had been. Between them are the grave clothes. These two angels will say to her, you're seeking Jesus. He's not here. He's risen, as he said. Behold where he lay. And they both gesture, don't you see, to the grave clothes sprinkled with blood, the blood that has put away sin for all time. She is seeing nothing less than the living Ark of the Covenant. This is the reality the golden ark that Moses had made was simply a type and a figure. It foreshadowed this true reality. You see, Jesus has set up the Holy of Holies in a tomb. The most unclean place has now become the Holy of Holies. He is transforming the world. We'll see that more next week. He's changing everything. And for 1,400 years, it was only the sons of Aaron, the high priest, who were able to see the, the vision in type and shadow and go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies once a year. But now Mary Magdalene is seeing, in the reality of it, she's seeing the holy ark where God it's, it represented the throne of God, and now he is reigning over sin and death. And Mary Magdalene is the one who sees that. No veil. With unveiled face, she sees the glory of God. What is that telling us? It's telling us that God has made Mary into the high priest. Don't you see? We are all of us made priests. We don't have to go to some man somewhere. 
In order to go to God, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. All of us can go directly to the Father through the Son. All of us. And Mary is the one who represents that truth. The one who had been defiled by seven demons. This woman who had been a whore has now been made into a holy priest of God. Now that is part of the redemption. That's part of the redemption, but that's not all of it. So she said to the angels, because they have taken away the Lord, why are you weeping, woman? The greatest day in the history of the world. Why are you, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Can you enter into that? If Jesus were taken away from you, would that not be the time of tears? So her tears, she's, she's sorrowing for the one she loves. She can't be satisfied until she sees him. And all she thinks she has to hope for is to see his body. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. You see, Jesus comes up from behind. It's part of his humanity, just like we do when we love to surprise our loved ones. We want to see their face when they see us and they don't expect to see us. He does that numbers of times this day. He will come up behind. He will come up behind her. He's standing, the posture of life. And she's looking for a corpse, so she kind of hears a voice when he says, woman, why are you weeping? He, she turns around and sees Jesus standing, and she did not know it was Jesus. And he says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? And she's supposing him to be the gardener. Now, what is Mark telling you? He's prompting you to think of something else. You see, Jesus comes forth from the tomb with a wound in his side. That means that the Father has prepared a bride for him. But the bride for Jesus is the universality. It's all of those who have applied to mercy. We are all called the bride of Christ. But he, she, God has chosen one woman to represent all of us. And that woman is Mary Magdalene. And so Jesus comes up to her, and he doesn't call her Mary. He calls her woman. Why? You see, Jesus is the new Adam. He's the bridegroom with the wounded side. He's come forth like Adam from the earth. He is in a garden. And here is this woman who's beautiful in soul. And her purity has been restored. And he calls her woman. He gives her the name that Adam gave to Eve. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Her life had been taken out of the blood and the water in his own side. He gives her the dignity of calling her woman, and she thinks he's the gardener, having no idea that he is the gardener. He's the new Adam. He's restored the fellowship of God and man in the garden, don't you see? He's brought peace where Adam and Eve lost the garden and the intimacy of fellowship with God. Jesus has gained that back for us. And he calls her woman. And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've tarried him away, tell me where you've laid him. And I will go and take him away. Her love knows no logic. She couldn't move that stone. She couldn't carry away a corpse. But look at what happens. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. He calls her by her name. He calls all of us by name who love him. And we know his voice. And she turned and she saw him. And she said, Rabboni. Now, who is she now? When she turns and she sees him, who is she? Jesus said to his disciples, when he was taken away from them, they would be like a woman in labor when her hour comes upon her. She's sorrowful for the labor that comes in waves. But there will come a time when she has the child, and then all of that sorrow will be forgotten for the joy that has been set before her. And so who is Mary now? You see, her grief in seeing her Savior tortured to death that came upon her in waves for these three days. When she sees Jesus, that immediately stops for her joy that Jesus has been born into the world again. You see, Jesus in his birth was in the care of a Mary and a Joseph, wasn't he? Joseph of Arimathea. And, I mean, Joseph of Nazareth and Mary of Bethlehem, uh, Joseph of Bethlehem, Mary of Nazareth. 
But in his death, he's in the care of a Mary and Joseph as well, Joseph of Arimathea and Mary Magdalene. His body was wrapped in the linen bands of a swaddling cloth of a child of an infant. Now his body has been wrapped again in the shroud of death. All the, the angels have come from heaven in both his birth and in his resurrection to announce glorious good news to men who will believe. So she is now playing the role of Mary, the virgin mother. Do you see the pattern here? Just like you have your loved ones and you love to put different frames on them that show different aspects of their beauty, the evangelists are showing you three frames, there are many more by the way, but three frames to show you Mary Magdalene and her beauty. How is she framed? Well, she's like a new Eve, we saw that. She's being compared to Eve in her creation, in her innocence and beauty. She's being compared to Mary of Nazareth the virgin mother of Jesus. And she's likewise being compared to the high priest of Israel, the holiest man in Israel. All three of these pictures speak of extraordinary holiness and purity and virginity. Why? Because in her redemption, all of that has been given back to her. The redemption of God restores everything that the enemy has taken including her purity and her love of God, her undefiled love of God. That is the Savior we follow. That's the promise of the gospel, that whatever, whatever oppression we have had, whatever sin that has defiled us, whatever wrongs that have been done to us, whatever wrongs that we've done ourselves, all of that can be forgiven in the mercy of Christ. He is the one who is merciful. Anyone who applies to him for mercy will surely find it. And he says, if anyone comes to him, what does he say? I will in no wise cast him out. Anyone can come, but you must come. He takes the just punishment that is justly deserving of us, and we're all condemned by the law. But he takes that on himself and pays the full payment for that to the Father on the cross. But you see, we need the resurrection to make our stories whole and pure again. The resurrection, he rolls away the stone, not just of his tomb, but of your tomb and my tomb, all of us who believe in him. He decapitates death itself. Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? He makes all of our stories redeemed and whole. He makes us become what he wants us to be, what he saw that we should be. All of our hope is in him and in his glorious death and resurrection on our behalf. That's the love that's offered to you. So we pray that you will come. If anyone does not know his love, come. The gospel is clear. The gospel says if anyone will confess with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in his heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that death is decapitated, that door is opened and forever. So anyone who wants to come and find his mercy, anyone who wants to talk to our prayer counselors and confess that faith that has been given to you, the time is open. The counselors will come forth and will ask God to attend you in the way as you come, for Jesus' sake. Father, we thank you for your great mercy. We thank you for the gift of your Son, the most precious thing you could give us, you have given in Christ. We bless you for that gift, apart from which we have nothing and can hope for nothing but eternal damnation and hell. But you and your mercy have given us eternal life and in heaven to be eternally with him the one who loved us, the one who loves us and promises to be with us and to love us for all eternity. What grace, what mercy, what forgiveness. We ask for your mercy to be upon us this morning and for any who does not yet know him, that they might come and find grace. Amen. Hey, can we thank God for his word this morning? Thank Dr. Gage. You get up on your feet today as we finish our service.
Here's what I know. Here's what God is doing this morning. He's putting a mirror before us today, and sometimes that's good. We got to do some soul searching. We got to do some, some reflection, uh, spirit reflection, and, and just look at that mirror and see what it is that God wants to change in us. The resurrected Christ, the power that rose Jesus from the dead is in this place today through the Holy Spirit. And I know he's speaking to us in diverse and different ways. Our prayer counselors are here in the, in the front. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, so, so both have to happen. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus was raised from the dead and that God the Father literally rose him from the dead, that he is Lord, then we will be saved. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for all that you've done in this service. I thank you for all that you've done in our hearts. Lord, for those who perhaps are, are being called out to be your sons into sonship, God, I pray that they would be obedient to your voice. I thank you because we can come forth and we find in you not a, a grumpy uh, father who's ready to hurt us or a father who's ready to condemn us, but a father who loves us and welcomes us home. Thank you because in your arms we find mercy, we find grace, we find freedom, we find favor. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. Just take a moment, just take 30 seconds to just reflect as the Holy Spirit puts it in your heart of those things that perhaps you need to give to the Lord today. We surrender it to you, Jesus. All that we are, everything we represent, in your arms today, Jesus. Father, today we want to thank you for those who give cheerfully and give willingly. Thank you for all that's happening in our church, Christ the Rock, and around the world in your global church, but specifically our campus. Thank you for those who willingly give to your kingdom. God, I pray that harvest time would never be far away from them. God, and that multiplication would be a reality in every family represented in this place. Those who want to give and can't give, God, I pray that you would bless them as well to give into your kingdom, Lord. And now to our great God who is able to do exceedingly beyond all that we could ask or imagine. To that God be the glory, the majesty, the praise forever and ever we pray. And all of God's people said amen and amen. God bless you, Christ the Rock. See you next week.